in Isaiah, it was mentioned in that song just a little while ago. Some of the elements of that song comes directly from the scripture that I'm preaching from, Isaiah chapter 9. And there's been sermons preached from this passage. I think Adrian Rogers preached one, uh, Christmas in Isaiah or Christmas in the Old Testament, something like that. And, uh, and I've heard others, lots of messages preached about Christmas in Isaiah. I want to preach on the promised prince of preach, uh, the promised prince of peace. And we'll start reading in verse number 9, verse number 1. I mean chapter 9, verse number 1. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation, speaking of Israel, when at the first he lightly, God, lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea, uh, the way of the sea was a, a, a trunk road that came from Mesopotamia down along the uh, Mediterranean coast through Israel and, and wound up in Egypt, a travel route in those days. And that's the way of the sea. Beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation, and not increased the joy. They joy there before thee, according to the joy in the harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden, and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is confused with noise, and garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Now notice especially verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Brother Aiden, would you come and pray and ask God to bless the message today and uh, just ask God to be with us as we go into this special time of worship for him. Would you please? Dear Lord, um, I pray that you would prepare every single, uh, every single one here's hearts for the message today, that they won't only hear, but also apply it to their lives as they walk out these doors. And please, Lord, um, help them live today safely and all, all the days that they live. And thank you for, the, for today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. The prophesied or promised Prince of Peace. Promised Prince of Peace. Isaiah chapter 9 is one of those passages in the Old Testament that helps us to look back as New Testament Christians and see where the Savior was prophesied. The Messiah was coming. He was coming to Israel. But we as Gentiles in this church age are able to inherit a lot of the promises, not that the promises were made directly to us, but they were made to Israel, but because of the, the new covenant takes all of us in even as Gentiles. Now today, we're, I said we're talking about just especially worshiping the Lord uh, and focusing on Him. Our lukewarm Christianity culture today seems to have an attitude of, what can God do for me today? What can God do for me? What's in this for me? Uh, I read the Bible and I want God to do something for me. I come to church and I expect God to do something for me. I pray and I want God to do something for me. And while we need to take time, actually today, at least today, to ponder the question, what can I do for Him? 
John Fitzgerald Kennedy said decades ago, he said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That thought is what I'd like to carry over into this time we have with the Lord today just to think instead of focusing on me and my needs but to give praise and honor and adoration and worship to Him. We tend to want to focus on our hurts. We want God to fix our finances. We want God to elevate us and to make us feel better, to give us joy. But He desires, even though we have a fallen nature, He wants us to fellowship with Him, to adore Him, to worship Him, to be with Him. And one of the highest things I can do is to worship the Lord. You know, we talk about soul winning. We talk about church attendance. We talk about our prayer time and our Bible reading time. And all those are great things. But He wants to fellowship with us and He desires our worship. Now concerning our Bible text this morning that we read in Isaiah, we find a prophecy of a coming Prince of Peace, a Deliverer, a Messiah, a Savior. World history is filled with failed attempts to provide a government that will bring about peace. And while there may have been little spots of peace here and there throughout history, maybe from time to time, it's all come tumbling down sooner or later and there's been no lasting peace. I mean, we've got war going on right now. Even the people of God that's being afflicted here in Isaiah chapter 9, the, the Hebrew people, the Jews, the Israelites are still being afflicted today. And uh, they've been afflicted. Now, true, a lot of that uh, has been brought onto them by their rejection of Jesus Christ nationally as their Messiah. But yet, he promises over and over again that he's going he's to bring them back to him eventually. And that day will come. And so that's why they are his chosen people. And we need not think, like some theologians do, that the church has replaced Israel. The church has been a part of a, a parenthesis in time. When God got tired of dealing with Israel and he turned his back on them to deal with the church where you and I, the Gentiles, come in, or any saved Jew is part of the church as well today. But these monarchs and dictators and revolutionaries have all promised great governments over, over the centuries and... Kings have ruled maybe in a very brutal way in a lot of times and dictators uh, promised that communism was going to just be that utopia that everybody needed, that poor people are going to get everything they need and, and the rich people would have to share with the poor people so everybody is equally blessed, although it didn't work out that those despots who ruled, well, they remained rich while the poor people still suffered. So communism failed, and it failed miserably, and we have a great movement in America today to go uh, forward into communism and dump the government we've got, which would be a huge mistake, and they would bring destruction upon themselves if they got their wish. Governments have come, and governments have gone, and yet none of them have produced what mankind longs for, a lasting peace. But our scripture today tells us of a Savior who would be born, and in other scriptures it says that he would be born in Bethlehem, and there's no doubt about it that Jesus is that Messiah, he is that Savior, and he is prophesied in this passage of scripture that he will eventually bring lasting peace, everlasting peace. The U.S. is a constitutional republic with some democratic elements. We are not a pure democracy, and I thank God for that, actually, that we're not a pure democracy because that's basically another terminology for that. If we, if we just had a pure democracy, it would mean mob rule. So if everybody, if everybody decides they don't like Brother Aubrey, we could just uh, kick him out of the country or, or execute him. That's the way a, a, a pure democracy works. But we're a constitutional republic, with democratic elements. We are democratic in the sense that we vote for our representatives to represent us in government. And so we pick the ones that we feel will do the best for us. And that's been, so far, it's been the, a good form of government, better than the things that's been practiced in the last, in the last centuries. And uh, Winston Churchill uh, in the last century said that 
that democracy or democratic type governments are the worst kind, except for all the others. <laughs> and while it might not be perfect, the government we've got, it's still probably the best one on the face of the earth, and yet it has its flaws. But Jesus will come one day. The second coming of Jesus, which is part of what is being prophesied here, if that second coming, he will complete what was not accomplished at the first coming. Why didn't he do it all the first time he came? Well, he offered himself as Messiah to Israel, and they said, no, we'll not have you. We reject you. And so at the cross, he turned his Messiahship from Israel into saviorship for the whole world. And now we, regardless of race, creed, color, ethnic background, Jews alike can receive Christ as Savior and we are part of His spiritual kingdom now and will be part of that physical kingdom when He returns again at the second coming. Now, predictions of His next coming, I'll say, uh, a lot of people have tried and failed to set dates. The Bible clearly says no man knoweth the day nor the hour. Uh, we can know when He's coming when we see him coming. Now the problem is you and I that are saved are not going to see him coming. We're going to be with him when he comes. The Bible teaches that there will be a rapture and uh, we'll be caught up. We who are saved, we're trusting Christ as Savior. We'll be caught up and we'll be with him until his second coming, whenever that is. And when he comes back, we're going to be riding some horses with him. I hope you like horses. <laughs> in your you know, I'm, I'm kind of afraid of horses, but I never rode one in the sky for sure. <laughs> but it's going to happen one day. We're going to come back with him. Now, unless he comes back while we're still alive in this earthly body, at that moment, the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, that we're going to be caught up together with him in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll go to be with him at that time. And, and uh, then we'll come with him in the second coming. He will set up his kingdom when he comes back. Now, as we unfold the text before us, we'll see the Messiah bringing light to overcome darkness. And I said we want to just focus on the Messiah today. Forget about your finances. Forget about your physical problems. Forget about your emotional distress. Forget about your family trouble just for a little while and just focus on the Lord today and let's, let's give Him our adoration. Let's give Him our praise. Let's give Him our worship for a little while. He is the light of Prince, number one. The light he is the prince of light. Isaiah 9, 2 that we just read. The people that walked in, what? Darkness have seen a great light. This is the great light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. The northern kingdom at this time, uh, of Isaiah's time, the northern kingdom, had, they had gone so far into idolatry. They had gone so far into sin that God is bringing chastisement upon that northern kingdom and that's who Isaiah, Isaiah was primarily a prophet to the land of Judah in the south, but right now he's talking about the northern kingdom. And the reason he's talking about that northern kingdom, they're bringing chastisement from God upon them from outside enemies because they refuse to turn back to God. And he's using that as an illustration for the southern kingdom of Judah. He's saying, now look what's happening to the northern kingdom, and if you don't straighten up your act, that same thing that's happening to them is going to happen to you, and sure enough, it did when they got carried away to Babylon. Northern kingdom got carried away to Assyria. In Matthew 4, <coughs> 14, that this promised Messiah, this promised Prince of Peace that is mentioned in Isaiah is clearly identified in Matthew repeating these same words, Matthew 4.14, that it might be fulfilled. What fulfilled? What was said by Isaiah back in chapter 9 of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Some 700 years previously. Isn't it amazing how God prophesies things in this book? And he can do it hundreds of years before. And it comes to pass just like that. Just like he intended. That it might be fulfilled, Matthew 4.14. 14, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. That's the New Testament Greek term for Isaiah. 
Isaiah the prophet saying, The land of Zabulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, verse 16, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. He's saying that this Messiah, this prophesied Messiah in Isaiah chapter 9, is the one who brings light to a land that is lying in darkness. Some of our Christmas songs speak about a time of darkness when the Savior was born in Bethlehem. Darkness and gloom during Isaiah's time hung over the entire land. Darkness, especially that northern kingdom, it was gloomy. It was gloomy over all humanity. But the Redeemer, the Messiah, would bring light and joy to the world. Don't we sing that? Joy to the world? <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's bringing light. He's bringing joy. In John 8, 12, Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So Jesus said to the northern kingdom, I'm coming to bring you light. You're in darkness, but I'm coming to bring you light. What does he say to all of this world that we live in today? What did he say when Jesus walked the face of the earth? There's darkness, but I've come to bring light. He's come to bring light today, and men sit in darkness. Men look for everything under the sun to bring them light and joy, and they look everywhere except up to see the one who can bring them joy and lasting peace. John 12, 46, I am, Jesus said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. What's he saying there, friend? He's saying that once I bring you out of darkness, I don't want you to go back. You're to walk in the light. And so that's why he came. His name, Emmanuel, he came to save his people from their sins. And so when he saves us, he doesn't mean for us to go back into the world and to live in darkness and to handle the dark things of the world as we did before we got saved. When you get saved, the Bible says, you're a brand new creature. Old things have been passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And he means for his people to live in the light. That's why, friends, I say that Christians need to avoid much of what the world does today because they're struggling in their sin, in their darkness, and instead of us emulating Hollywood, they need to find out where the light is that we found. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's that peace. The peace that passeth all understanding. Peace with God is salvation. The peace of God brings us joy in daily life. Like the darkness of Israel that Isaiah preached about. The world was dark and dreary, dreary and desperate when the Messiah came to be born in Bethlehem. Oh, it was dark. King Herod, what did he do? He tried to snuff out the light. He was going to kill all the babies and killed all of them. Jesus was taken by his parents into Egypt to escape the, uh, the sword of Herod, the darkness of the world. Well, in John 1, 19 through 11, or John 1, 9 through 11, listen to this. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The true light. Now notice that Jesus is the true light, and the Bible says that it is the light which lighteth every man. Sometimes people ask me, what about the heathen in a faraway land? They've never heard the name of Jesus. Will they go to heaven? The Bible says that he lighteth every man. So the idea that's being promoted in the scripture is that every person all around the world can have light if they so desire. They get just a little sparkle of light. Even like the native that in deepest, darkest Africa, he knew there had to be something more than just this human existence. And the story goes, as he longed to know 
who it was that gave him life and what exists after this life. It is said that he was so desperate to know about this person, this creator. He would look up in the sky and he'd see the stars, the planets, the moon. And he thought, this can't be all there is. Somebody did that. He climbed up into a tree, not knowing anything else, not knowing the name of Jesus. He climbed up into a tree and said, if you're out there, and you must be because I can see your handiwork. I want to know you. I don't know who you are, but I want to know you. Please let me find out who you are. A few days later, a missionary showed up in his village and told him about Jesus. You see, he had a glimmer of light. The Bible says in Romans that, that anyone can look up in the sky and by God's general revelation, they can see that there must be a God and if they don't reject that light, then God will send them a specific light that will let them know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so nobody goes to hell who did not have an opportunity to know the light. Because the Bible says, He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own Jewish nation would not receive him. And that's when he turned to the church. People need light today, and that's why you and I need to share that light with others. In 2010, there was a mining accident in the country of Chile, South America, and 33 men were trapped a half mile under the earth. The, the mine caved in. There was a spiral road that goes right down into the heart of the earth, and they would have to descend into that mine going around a helix spiral of a descending road that eventually got them to the bottom. And that's where they were the day that the earth shifted and that mine caved in. There were safe rooms on different levels. Those men were at the bottom, and when the crushing rocks began to fall, they entered into a safe room, 2,300 feet below the surface, total darkness. They all lived through that quake. And when the people above discovered that the mining accident had happened, they began to try to devise some rescue efforts, and they would try to go down that helix road, but it was blocked in many different places where they couldn't get through, and the heavy equipment was shaking the earth, and they were afraid it was going to cave it in even more, and if anybody was still down there alive, they would crush them even worse. And so that was August the 5th of 2010. It was a copper and gold mine, and the government began to try to recover these men trapped below. After 69 days, they were drilling down from the top with a drill bit about six inches in diameter, drilling down, and they'd already hit one cavity room where no sign of life was discovered. They kept drilling, and they hit another bigger cavity. And that's when, when they pulled the drill bit back up, those 33 miners had made up some signs during their time. They were down there for 69 days. Can you imagine being a half mile underground trapped in total darkness for over two months. <laughs> they only had a few supplies down there. How they made it is a miracle. But they had made up some signs and taped it to that drill bit. And so when the miners on top pulled the drill bit out, they found the sign. It said, we're all in this refuge and we're all still alive. And so then they began to take up rescue efforts in earnest. And even though they couldn't get down there with heavy equipment, they drilled a little larger hole all the way down. And while they were drilling that hole, they designed, countries from all over the world got involved in this, 
they designed a little capsule that would bring up like one man at a time. And it was descending down like a little tiny elevator would go all the way down, a half mile deep, bring out one man and then another, and they got them all out. Can you imagine what the light looked like to them when, after being underground for two months? They needed some light. But let me tell you something that's even worse than that. It's a world around us that's pining in darkness, and without a Savior, they'll surely perish, and they will surely go to hell, and they will never know the light ever again for all eternity. That's why the Prince of Light came. That's why the Prince of Peace came, to share the light with the whole world. The Prince of Peace is the light who dispels darkness. Next, we notice the character of the Prince. We see that he is the Prince of Peace, but... Why? Let's look at it in verse number 6. This is probably the most famous verse in this passage. In verse 6 it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The child is born and a son is given. We see the marriage of humanity and deity in the same person. It is said in Isaiah seven fourteen. Just a couple chapters back, it's already been announced that he would be born of a virgin. It says in verse seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. A virgin shall conceive. But how could a virgin conceive? That sounds impossible. But the the Bible say, with God all things are possible. If he created man, couldn't he put a baby in the womb of a virgin? Why did he need to do that? Why is it so special? And why do we protest so much when people, as they do in a lot of the versions of the Bible, try to change the word virgin to young woman? Why do we, as independent Baptists, and, and we believe in the fundamentals of the faith, why do we protest so much and when they try to change that to young woman and do away with the virgin? Because the sin nature was passed down through the male line and instead of the female line. The woman could be a virgin and she could still conceive if God was the father. And that would be the unification of deity and humanity in the same person. Jesus had to be deity in order to be the Savior of the world. He could not be sinless without being deity. He could not be the Savior, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace without being God. And yet he could not suffer for our sins had he not lived in a human body. And so both those ideas are married together in the one thought. The child is born and the son is given. And then it says... He is a, he will have the government upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is all that is good and just as a king. This prince becomes the king. He will bring in a physical kingdom. And as he promised Israel that at that time, they could have had the kingdom had they accepted his offer, but they rejected Jesus, and so now it's on postponement. He will give the kingdom another shot, a thousand-year reign. But why is he called wonderful? Well, probably because of all his signs and miraculous wonders. Remember the miracles he did? Feeding of 5,000, raising the widow's son from the dead. He was the one who could call fire down from heaven. He was the one who could make... Deaf people here. He was the one who could take blind eyes and make them to see wonderful signs. And wonder Hey, if you were blind, would you think if he restored your sight, would you think he was pretty wonderful? <laughs> what if you couldn't hear and he gave you your hearing back? Wouldn't you say, he's, that's a wonderful sign. He must be who he says he is. He's wonderful. And then it calls him counselor. Do you know who can give the best advice? <laughs> it's him. The Prince of Peace, he can give advice that will work. Many times we humans give each other advice and we give each other counsel and sometimes it might work a little bit and sometimes it might not. But his advice 
is perfect. His word is perfect. And that's why we need church. That's why we need the preaching. That's why we need the teaching. That's why we need times to walk with him, to find out more about him. He's called the mighty God. You mean Jesus was God? Absolutely. Jesus was and is God. Mighty God. That refers to his deity and his power to accomplish that which he endeavors to do. Whatever he chooses to do. Can he bring about that peace? The everlasting peace? Yes, because he's deity. He's all powerful. The Bible, uh, the theologians call it omnipotence. All powerful. He's omniscient. All knowing. And he has the power to do whatever he plans to do. He's called the everlasting father. Now that confuses some people. The ever everlasting father? Uh, is that saying he is God the father? No, that's not what it said. It says the everlasting father. First of all, he's, let's think about the everlasting word. He's everlasting in that he had no beginning. Bethlehem was not his beginning. <laughs> Oh, no, dear friend. He existed long before Bethlehem. He existed before this world existed. He existed before there was a single angel. He existed before there was anything but Him, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine in your finite mind what it means to be everlasting? Now, we as Christians assume that since we're saved, we're going to have everlasting life from this point forward. But he had everlasting life from this time backwards as well as forward. There was no beginning to Jesus. You say, well, that's just hard for me to believe. And yet atheists, evolutionists will say, this universe has just always existed. <laughs> but they can't accept the fact that God always existed. He's everlasting. But what about the term father, everlasting father? If he's not the father, he's the son, the prince of peace. But how can he be the everlasting father? Because the father word refers to his fatherliness. Did you have a father that you admired? A father who protected the home, who guided the home, who loved the home, who loved his family, provided everything that they needed, all it, Friend, we need families with the father figure in it. I know that there's many times there's single parents and there's broken families and there's blended families and I understand all that. But boy, if we, the closer we can get our nation back to the nuclear family where there's a dad in the home, a mom in the home, and the children respect their parents and they're being trained by parents who actually live in the home, a fatherly figure. My father wasn't all that I had wished he would have been in my earlier years. But I knew that he would put some food on the table. I knew that he would pay some bills. I knew that if anybody tried to hurt his family that he would be in their hair. I had a father. There was a man in the house. And friends, we need a man in the house. And when you've got Jesus, the everlasting father, you have a fatherly figure. Even if you don't have an earthly father anymore, you have, a, you have a father who is like that friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You have a father that you can always rely on. You have a father that you can always speak to anytime you please. You have a father who says that he's going to be near you and with you. And you don't go unnoticed, friend. You may pray and think, well, he's not answering my prayers. Oh, he hears. Now, how he answers is his business, but he hears and he knows you're there and he hasn't forgotten about you. And he loves you. He's your everlasting fatherly figure. If you lost a husband, we know we have widows in our church that lost a husband and that man is not in the house anymore. You have a fatherly figure in the Lord Jesus who is still with you. Why? Because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And he's in your home too. Make your home inviting to him. Well, he's known as the everlasting father in this passage of scripture. And then he's also called the prince of peace. 
Prince of Peace. How's he going to bring about peace? Well, there won't be any peace without power, I can guarantee you. In this dangerous world in which we live, and America needs to learn a lesson from this, that you can't portray a nation like this as being weak and expect to be respected by the other nations of the world. The brutes, the atheists, the cultists, and the hateful people in the world will run over this nation if we don't display power. It takes power. And friend, there is no power higher than Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. He'll bring about peace. He'll bring about everlasting peace. It's not on the earth right now because He hadn't come back at the second coming, but He will. And when He comes back at the Battle of Armageddon at the end of this age, we'll go through seven years of tribulation. There will be all hell break loose on earth and the devil will have free reign all over the earth. You and I, thankfully, will be gone. I don't care what the other theologians say. Uh, we're, we as saved people are not going to be here during the tribulation. The Bible says, God hath not appointed us unto wrath. We're going out with Jesus. But there will be a lot of people left behind and they'll go through a literal hell on earth before going to the eternal hell if they don't get saved. And during that time, Jesus is just going to back off and say, okay, world, you didn't want me. You didn't want my father. You didn't want my word. You wanted to live it up and do it your way. Have at it. And that's what's going to happen during those seven years. And at the end of the seven years, Jesus is going to come back, the second coming. And when he plants his feet down on the other side of the brook of Kidron, on the Mount of Olives, when he comes back, he's going to engage in one more battle. And he's going to say to Antichrist and all of his armies at Armageddon, he's going to say, drop dead. And they will. And he wins. It takes power to bring peace. Now, at that point, the millennial reign of Christ sets in. And you and I and the saved Jews from the tribulation, and there's going to be other people saved. The Bible says in Revelation that, that those who are saved, among those who are saved, are going to be people from every tribe, kindred, and nation. So, yeah, people are going to get saved during tribulation time. Now, I don't suspect maybe... It would be a pretty risky thing to reject Christ now and go through the tribulation because there will be great deception and a, a good many people are going to still reject Christ and go to hell. But at that time, he, he wins the battle of Armageddon. And when that happens, peace will prevail for a thousand years. And then the Bible says in Revelation that, that the devil will be released from the bottomless pit for one last hoorah. The devil thinks he's got one more chance. And so even though people who were living in natural bodies in the millennial reign of Christ, they were born to parents who were saved in the tribulation time, so they won't have a spiritual body. They won't have a resurrection body. They'll still be living in carnal flesh. And some of those will reject Christ, and they'll follow the devil. They'll follow Satan at the end of the millennial reign, and then he will be promptly defeated. And peace will reign from that time forward forevermore. Never war again. That's why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. This government that he will institute, verse number 7 of our text says, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even for ever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. His realm will be expanded. The whole earth will become his realm. He will rule on the throne of David in Jerusalem and even David will bow at that time before the Prince of Peace and the Lord Jesus will be sitting on the throne of David. <coughs> Gentiles, church, saved Jews, tribulation saints, and millennial subjects are all going to increase in knowledge. See, when you, get, when you go to heaven, you're not going to be dumber than you are now. I have people ask before, will we know each other in heaven, or will we know things that happened in the past? Will we, will be, will we have the same knowledge, or will we forget everything once we get to heaven? 
Well, I don't think God would save us and then make us dumber. <laughs> so I think you'll know everything you know now. You'll know all the people you know now, plus more. And as God's knowledge is infinite, the more time we spend in heaven, the more knowledgeable we'll become about him. We'll know more about, more about Jesus, would I know? Remember that song? We're going to know more about him as time goes on. All through eternity, we'll still be learning and knowing. And I can prove that from the scriptures. We don't have time this morning, but I can show you in Revelation where we will increase in learning in heaven. We'll know more as time goes by. Well, centuries before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Isaiah prophesied the virgin birth that we learn from other passages that would be in Bethlehem, which we... Celebrate that birth today and tomorrow, every year. And that was only the beginning of his story. <laughs> it ain't over yet. Bethlehem, there's people who celebrate Christmas that don't have a clue. Why we're celebrating Christmas? They don't know that he lived a sinless life. They don't know that he came to bear our burdens on the cross. They don't know that that birth in Bethlehem gave us a Savior who would become the Prince of Peace. They don't know. They think it's about Christmas trees and exchanging presents and, and those more secular type things. And some of those things are fun, but friend, they don't take the place of the sinless Son of God who came to be our Prince of Peace. Have you trusted Him as your Savior? I'm asking people on watching online, have you trusted him as your Savior? Place your faith, your trust in him today. Tell him you know you're a sinner, just like the Bible says. Tell him that you know he died for your sins. Tell him that you want to be one of his children. And then trust what he did on the cross of Calvary. And he'll save you if you'll do that. As we say, Merry Christmas and exchange gifts and enjoy feasts and reunions. We'll take time. I hope we take time to bow in humble adoration and worship of the Prince of Peace. Christian, are you living in his joy, in his light? I hope so. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Oh, what a wonderful Savior. Oh, what a wonderful Lord. Our knowledge is limited, Lord, and we just don't know everything that we would like to know. But we do know, at least in the, a general way, that you came to die on the cross of Calvary for us and that the cradle was only the beginning of that earthly story. It only gives us a, a little bit of insight into what you did for us. How you not only went to the cross, but you came out of that tomb. Lord, how wonderful your name is. The mighty God, everlasting Father, wonderful, counselor, Prince of Peace. Lord, help us to worship you today for who you are and not just for what we can get out of you. Bless your holy name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you need to pray, the altar is open for you.